G'day, mate. Happy Thursday, wherever you happen to be. It occurred to me today that no matter how you vote, Labor kind of gets whatever it wants. What am I talking about? I was thinking about this today about Bill Shorten back in 2019. Now, he was odds on with all of the political people, but we all know why he didn't become Prime Minister. But what were his key ideas that he took to an election that were rejected by the Australian people? Well, he was going to block the stage three tax cuts. He was going to introduce new rules on negative gearing and uh, franking credits. He also was going to place a 45% emissions target on the economy going into 2030. But we all know Australia rejected each and every one of those big ideas. Gone. See you later. Now, you would think that after they had been as soundly rejected as they were, that they would be dead, buried and cremated, like all of the things Liberal parties have to say are dead, buried and cremated every time that they lose an election. And then, of course, we got the current Prime Minister as the new leader of the Labor Party and his path to the Prime Ministership, apart from promising serious changes when it came to cost of living, that literally everything would be cheaper under a Labor government, well, uh, he, in fact, got rid of the negative gearing policy. He backed, backed the Stage 3 tax cuts. He said that a 45% emissions target was a mistake. And, of course, Australians believing that the things they had rejected in 2019 were also going to be rejected in 2022. In part, they elected the current Prime Minister. But, as we all know, this current Prime Minister, of course, was able to pretend that a 43% reduction in emissions targets was different than the 45% that was a mistake a couple of years earlier. Now, of course... The reason he was able to say he didn't have Bill Shorten's policy was because it was 2% less. And three years later, oh, and apparently it was going to save you money. Reducing power prices by $275. By 2025, $275 a, a year. $275 a year. We'll get power prices down by $275 a year. And on top of all of this, apparently the expectation was that there would be 600,000 new jobs that would fall from the sky between now and when your power bills are apparently going down next year. Well, OK. So the whole point was it was still Shorten's policy, it just was sold in a different way. But we were told that it was the mistake in 2019 to go after the changes to the tax system. And as we know, the Prime Minister ended up changing them anyway to the Bill Shorten position. So the Bill Shorten position that we rejected on an emissions target has now been repeated by this government. Their position when it comes to changes in taxes has been introduced by the government who promised not to do so. And now, of course, negative gearing. With a conversation coming from the crossbench and the media who like to cheer these things on are that the one idea that still is waiting to come from the Bill Shorten playbook that was rejected, the Bill Shorten playbook that was referred to as a mistake, but now they're in power and they assume no one's getting them out of power, they'll just potentially introduce it anyway. And we know why. Because the current Treasurer, despite saying at the last election no changes to negative gearing, was saying this when he was selling Bill Shorten's policy. So we know that two out of three of Bill Shorten's policies became the law of the land regardless of the fact that we rejected them. Is it going to be three out of three? Well, what do you reckon the chances are that the Treasurer will be able to act on how he's always felt about negative gearing? But any housing policy that doesn't deal with negative gearing and capital gains tax is a sham. Housing affordability, which doesn't uh, make important and considered changes to capital gains and negative gearing, uh, has a hole in the middle of it. If you want to deal with housing affordability, you need to start with negative gearing and capital gains. And despite the fact that he is getting ready to implement what he has always believed but was rejected from the Australian people, then hid from the Australian people, what a surprise that right now, 
is when the puffy profile pieces of Jim Chalmers, potential future leader, are starting to pop up in the newspapers, including that one over summer, remember, where he admitted to being a little bit loose when he was on the cans in Parliament, but <laughs> who would ever investigate exactly what that was about? So the lesson for all of us to learn here is that regardless of how you vote and regardless of which Labor person hates the other Labor person and then will walk away from the Labor person when they eventually become the leader, we still get the policies that we rejected at an election. So you should just remember this next time they say, absolutely, we're not going there. We've learnt our lessons from last time. No, they just wait till they get in and then they assume they're so awesome that you won't remember. Now, a little more on the negative gearing thing, where the Greens are deciding to particularly highlight that the Prime Minister has got a couple of investment properties and therefore that's the reason why he's not going to move on negative gearing. If Labor wants to deal with housing affordability, then it's time to phase out the billions of dollars in tax concessions property investors get every year in the form of negative gearing and capital gains tax concessions. A lot of renters are going to start asking the question, why do we have a Labor government with a property investor as a Prime Minister who is fighting to protect negative gearing and capital gains tax concessions in the middle of the worst housing crisis we've seen in generations. Now, all of this is to do with the politics that we have spoken of in the past, which is that the Greens, which have always been the stable source of preferences for the Labor Party, so they can say whatever they want, they'll have less vote than us, so we'll always be able to pretend we won't be that too far to the left, but we're guaranteed to get the support from the left wing when it comes to the Greens. But as the last federal election showed, that there has been a surge in the vote for the Greens in areas that mean they end up getting one, two or several hundred more votes than the Labor Party, and then it's Labor preferences that get Greens elected. And also, the politics here is that currently, on most opinion polls, best case scenario, 14, maybe 15% of the vote. But 30% of Australians are renting. The Greens are desperately trying to gin up support amongst renters, that they become the party of renters. And if they can turn 15 into 16 or into 17%, well, then guess how many Labor seats start to fall to the Greens and the Greens start to take over as the power players of Australian politics. But the last part of what that bloke just had to say just got me thinking about the property investing Prime Minister. And this was the bloke who was going to be protecting negative gearing. Well, they were very specific in the choice of that bloke to be the one who was speaking. Because when you have a look at his interests listed on the Parliament House website, he doesn't own a house. But we've had a look at all of the other Greens to tell you whether they don't just own a house, but they too are property investing politicians that presumably are using the system of negative gearing like most people who invest in property. Now, they can come out and release a financial statement or tell us that we're wrong, but the following Greens politicians have got investment properties, like this one. The member for Ryan, Elizabeth Watson-Brown. Well, she doesn't just have a house... She's got an investment property, 50% funded by her, 50% by her partner, and she's got a holiday flat, again, 50% owned by her and 50% by her partner. Are there either of those being rented out? Well, I would presume so. If so, if they're running at a loss, guess what happens? Negative gearing kicks in. Then, of course, there's Senator Nick McKim from Tasmania. You see, he lives in a house. He owns a shack in regional Tasmania, and then he's got not one but two investment properties that presumably he too is getting a rental return from. Then there is a Senator Penny Alleman Payne. I'd never heard of either, but she's from Queensland. Well, guess what? She has got a house in Gladstone in Queensland and she's got an investment property which is her former house that presumably is being rented out. If not, I apologise. But it's listed in her pecuniary interest as an investment, something potentially she could be renting out, and if the rent isn't as much as the mortgage, negative gearing kicks in. And then one more time, can, can we play the comments of the Green who's trying to get you to believe that everyone in the Greens don't own houses, they're all renters, and the evil problem when it comes to protecting negative gearing is the Prime Minister because he owns some investment properties.
If Labor wants to deal with housing affordability, then it's time to phase out the billions of dollars in tax concessions property investors get every year in the form of negative gearing and capital gains tax concessions. A lot of renters are going to start asking the question, why do we have a Labor government with a property investor as a Prime Minister who is fighting to protect negative gearing and capital gains tax concessions in the middle of the worst housing crisis we've seen in generations? Well, funnily enough, there's another Greens MP. This is a senator. No doubt I'll be accused of racism for even mentioning what is freely available in the public documentation of Marine Faruqi. Remember, this was her pictured at a protest in Sydney with someone suggesting that the best place for the Jews to go was in the bin. Oh, but she deleted it, right? Well, um, she, of course, has a, a house. She has an investment property and a second investment property, one in Sydney and one in Port Macquarie. She's also got some land in Pakistan, but that's not relevant here. She has two investment properties. So my point is, is that the Greens are going to try to present themselves to the renters of Australia as people who are not at all involved in the scam of negative gearing. Yet, as I've just shown you, Senator after Senator after Senator and an MP has got not one but two investment properties. Now, does this mean that these people have to sell their properties? No, but it just means you have to be slightly more honest about your position when it comes to negative gearing. Now, like any reasonable person, I think once we start getting into the taxpayer financing of three, four, five and more homes, we're in trouble. Should the tax system be able to help you with the investment property and maybe a second investment property? Sure. Because if that's the way that you're able to accumulate wealth so that at a point later in life you're able to pull all of that money pay off your existing house, have money for your retirement, or more importantly, have money for when you start to need things like aged care, I don't have a problem. But you notice that none of the conversation about negative gearing is about that. It's just about saying the whole thing is just a dirty way of sending money to already rich people. Well, if that's the logic, they should have a look in the mirror before they try to have a go at everyone else. But would that surprise you that they don't have many of those in the Greens party room?